Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Pastor. So good to have you in church this morning. Welcome to our service, and a special word of welcome to those who are tuning in from the rest of the world. That's a nice way of putting it. We are such a wide family, and that people can be hearing this service uh, thousands of kilometers away. We are conscious of the struggle that you're going through, uh, particularly with the uh, rollout of vaccinations, but there is good news on the way, and we just want to thank God for what He is doing. Uh, in your country and in our country at this time. And now the greeting. The peace of the Lord be with you. God is with us. We come to the creator of the dusty desert, to the creator of fertile fields, to the creator of teeming seas. We come to the God who dwells within and without us, who seeks intimacy and relationship with us all. We come to the God who is found in the wilderness and yet in our hearts. We seek that intimate conversation that God would have with us in the depths of our being and the heart of our faith. As we ask Jesus, who are you? And he replies, I am. I am. And now let us pray. O oh God, our loving Heavenly Father, God of power and might, of knowledge, wisdom and truth, we thank and praise you that you show us how to overcome temptation and to keep our focus on you. We thank and praise you that you never give up on us, even when we get things wrong. We thank and praise you that when we go off course, you lead us back on track. Thank you, Lord, for your constant love. Thank you, Lord, that you are the Son of God, that you did not shrink from who you were meant to be, nor take a different path following deceptive voices. Help us to follow you as our Redeemer, Teacher and Supreme Example of what it means to be human. Lord, we confess that we have given in to the sin of pride, individually and collectively. With our lips we confess you as Lord, but the time and energy we expend in dealing with daily challenges, local disagreements and international conflicts demonstrate that we think we control our destiny. Lord, we say that we serve only you, yet we spend so much time in pursuit of comfort, security and keeping our place to ourselves. And it shows that we compromise with mammon. And so, Lord, because you are who you are, Son of God and fully human, you can heal the consequences of our wrong choices when we recognize and acknowledge them. Having withstood the temptations in your human person and having suffered betrayal, violence and death, there is nothing we can go through that you did not understand. You stand alongside us, reaching out wounded, healing hands. And so we pray that you'll forgive us our sins and grant us healing and a new humility as we seek to start over, to live life as you would have us live. We ask this, O oh Lord, in and through your wonderful name, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The New International Version, Jesus is tested in the wilderness. Luke 4, 1 to 13. <coughs> Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was tempted by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, 
he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. The devil then led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a lovely lentil story of the three brothers that were having a wonderful, wonderful time together and they had to separate and they said, you know, let's make a, 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 a sort of commitment to each other that every Friday <clears throat> we will go down to the pub and we, wherever we are, the one was from Germany, the other one was from South Africa, and the other one was from Australia. They said every Friday, we'll go down and order three beers each. That will be, for us then, a memory of, uh, of your, your other chaps that aren't uh, 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 with me. And so, this fellow from Australia, he went to the bar and he ordered these three beers every Friday. As clockwork. And the barman asked him eventually, and I said, why are you doing this? He says, well, the three brothers made this decision. Every Friday, I'm here in Australia, my brother's in uh, South Africa, my other brother's in Germany, and we do the same thing together. And this is a memory to remember each other. But the day came when he only ordered two beers. And so, of course, the barman was fearing that one of the brothers had died. So he said to him, why are you only ordering two beers? So the chap said, no, I've given up beer for Lent. <laughs> I owe a lot of my spirituality to my grandmother. Uh, she was Greek, and uh, I think I was speaking Greek fluent Greek before I could speak fluent English because she was with me almost uh, when I was about three years old I think she came into our home and she couldn't speak a word of English and I couldn't speak a word of Greek and so spending time with her I was able to learn Greek and I give thanks to God for that but the thing that impressed me about her was her spirituality and especially when it came uh, to the Lenten season. Uh, she stuck to that. And she would speak to me about God throughout my life, as I remember. And she, she used to, in the Lenten period, give up meat, uh, uh, chicken, and fish, and dairy products. Nothing of that. She didn't touch any of that during Lent. And I really admired her for the way that she could do it. And she wasn't miserable about it. She was enjoying it. And there was a sense of which she was drawing closer to God. And that I don't think I will ever forget. Now we have entered the, 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 the season of Lent. Um, we we, we we running on the seasons, our phases of life. And I'm trying to see 
as we look into the different phases that we go through as we work towards Easter. Now the finest image that one can have of Lent is the image of a desert, of Jesus going into the desert voluntarily to fast and pray. Now he voluntarily gave up everything, gave up his food, gave up his freedom and discarded all distractions and it tells us that the Spirit led him into the wilderness. Now, he did all this so that he could draw closer to God. Now hear that. He was fasting to draw closer to God. And of course, because he gave up everything, he was very vulnerable to temptation because he was fully human. And more so, he was more open to God at the same time. And so, what I want to say this morning is, I want us to explore the phase of Jesus' temptations and how we can succumb uh, to evil in our own lives. But first of all, I want to take the first point here, and that is the temptations of Jesus. I want us to look at those, and Bev has read them here for us this morning. He had three temptations, and I want to look at it. But I want to say to you that I'm drawing this from Ron Ron, Rollhauser. He uh, is a uh, a Catholic uh, theologian, and he takes a very interesting uh, side in this. And I I was really impressed by what he said about the three temptations. And I would like to, 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 to just share that with you. Now, he begins, and I think this is a very good beginning, and I know that this is a a stance that we as Uniting Church would take. And that is that um, this insight into temptations which Jesus had. During Jesus' baptism, he heard these words at the baptism. You are my blessed Son in whom I take delight. You are my blessed son in whom I take delight. Or in another one that says, in whom I'm well pleased. Now I want you to hear that these words defined, defined and formed his self-consciousness. Because he went with those words into the wilderness. Rollhauser goes on to say that throughout his life, Jesus struggled to always believe that. You know, we take it for granted that he just accepted that. He found it very hard to believe that. For instance, immediately after his baptism, we are told the Spirit drove him into the desert where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was empty in ways that made him vulnerable to believe that he was not God's blessed child. And so let's look at it from that perspective when you look at the three temptations. The first temptation he says to him, he says, if you are the son of God. Now notice there is that big word putting doubt into his mind immediately. If, if, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. In essence, the devil's taunt to him was, if you believe that you are God's specially blessed uh, blessed creature, the son of the most high God, Why is your life so empty? And Jesus, of course, responds. And he quotes scripture to him. He says, people do not live on bread alone. One doesn't live on bread alone. And you might render this in these words. I can be empty and still be God's blessed one. Being blessed and special is not dependent on how full or empty my life is at a given moment. The second temptation has to do with human glory and its absence. And so the devil shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and he says, all this will be yours if you just bow down and worship me. The whole thing of getting that out of him, making him feel that he could be great, just bow down, just compromise. If you're God's blessed son, how come you're you're an insignificant person, which he was up until that point? Not famous, not known, anonymous. And Jesus might have replied it this way. 
I can be insignificant person and still be God's blessed one. Blessedness does not depend upon fame or be a celebrity. Amen. The third temptation that comes is it follows on the same lines. The devil takes him on top of the temple and says, Now if you jump down here, the angels will gather around you. And he says, because uh, as we heard from the reading, he won't allow it to strike your foot against a stone. And there Jesus responds and says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Very interesting that one. Do not put your Lord your God to the test. The temptation and how we should resist it are both contained in Jesus' reply. In essence, what Jesus says to the devil challenges him, after he challenges him to throw himself out and he will be caught. He says, I will take the stairs down just like everyone else. Our blessedness is not based on being a VIP and using a VIP elevator or having any special privileges that set us apart from others. We are God's blessed ones even when we find ourselves riding in the city buses. Amen. How's that? What an angle. What an angle. And you know, when you look at that, you can only come to this conclusion. Don't forget that you and I are God's special, blessed sons and daughters, all of us. Even when our lives seem empty, anonymous, and devoid of any special privileges, because then we won't forever be putting God and our restless hearts to the test, demanding more than ordinary life can give us. That's the wonderful challenge. To put God to the test. Why isn't he doing this and why isn't he doing that? And so, having said that, and that's what Rolazo was giving, and for me it was really a blessing to read that and to have it work through it because it talks about the ordinariness and the same difficulty that Jesus had in the body. He went through everything as we go through because we always think he was privileged. And yeah, he's saying he went through what you and I went through, even more so. So, having said that then, how can we deal with a phase of temptation? And the first thing I think we need to do is to be aware that temptation comes to us all. Everybody sitting here is tempted. We all will be tempted at some time or other. And therefore we need to be anticipated. We need to anticipate that we will be tempted. Not to be surprised. Don't be intimidated by it. Don't be shocked by it. Instead, like the scouts say, be prepared. When temptation comes, what do we do? I don't know about you, but I, I struggle with some of my temptations. I really do. And sometimes I say to myself, how can you think like that? How can those thoughts that you're having come to you as a minister? Have you been, ever been in prayer and the most bizarre thought comes into your mind that has nothing to do with God but has everything to do with something that's not good. Hey? Has that ever happened to you? Or you're sitting in church and you're worshipping God right in this place where two or three are gathered together and you have the most amazingly big temptation that comes to you. And people have told me about some of those. They say, I was even sitting in church, let me tell you what I was thinking about. Where does that come from? And you say to yourself, how could I think such a thought? Will I ever get over this? Will it always happen to me? Well, let me tell you, it happened to Jesus continually. He was tempted. Now, we need to understand that temptation is not a sin. To be tempted at every point we is not a sin. What is a sin is when you succumb to the temptation, when you sit down and have a cup of tea with the temptation. Then you are in trouble. What does, what does uh, Hebrews tell us? For he faced all the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. He did not sin. He was perfect. 
You can't stop the birds from flying over your head, someone said, but you can prevent them from making a nest in your hair. <laughs> we can't stop sinful thoughts entering our minds, but we can prevent them from entertaining them. It all begins here. It begins in the mind. The temptation begins here. And from here, you foster it, think about it, work with it, and it becomes a reality in your life. Now, Paul in Ephesians 6 talks about how we should deal with temptation and how we should deal with these things. And he gives us a, quite an outline there in that, in that chapter, chapter 6 of Ephesians. And these words is what I think he, he, he really outlines right at the beginning. He says, receive the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is what he says right when he starts with the mind, because it starts in the mind. Receive or take or accept uh, are different translations. Now, why does he start with salvation as the first point? It's quite interesting when you read in the different uh, translations and also in the interpretation of this in the different theologians' mind. And, the, and you've got to come back to the point that what they're really saying here is that you really need to start protecting your mind first. And your mind, you yourself, cannot do that. We haven't got the strength to, 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 to handle the temptations that come into our mind. And, this, and he says that we need to have salvation. The helmet of salvation. Salvation is that you open yourself to God. That you allow God into your life so that He will help you to overcome that temptation. That's the helmet of salvation. The battle against temptation is fought in the mind. And the helmet of salvation protects the mind. And sometimes we don't realize that until we come up against things and we realize that we actually haven't got the strength. And so the one's got to start with that. The second thing he says there to receive God's word and that is the sword of the spirit is what you use to fight off the devil. Jesus used the Bible each time he was quoting from the Old Testament. A sword to fight with is part of the Christian armor. Claim the promises of Christ and that he has given in his word. For example, one says, what do you mean by that? Well, you need to be reminded of things when you're fighting the devil. I am reminded about certain points when I'm, when I'm going against difficult life. Take this one, for example. 1 Corinthians 10. You know how often this has helped me? God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Many people have said, if you were in my place, you'd realize that I couldn't resist that temptation. No, oh, you fall. But if you really, and try this when you have your next temptation, when you start turning to God. In that moment of temptation. The trouble is we don't want to turn to God in that moment. Sometimes we want to go into that temptation, and that's where we start with trouble. When that phase comes in your life, remember, you will never be tempted beyond what you can handle. That's what Paul says. He will always made, make a way out. It's tough. It's hard. But there will be a way out. Do you remember the Old Testament Joseph? Do you remember when uh, Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him? What did he do? He ran like like a Christian out of the place. <laughs> he just he just wasn't going, to, wasn't going to get caught up in this thing. We are constantly being tempted and our temptations hit us in vulnerable places. You will be tempted in your weaknesses. I never get tempted to steal money. I have never been tempted. And I mean, let me tell you, I have dealt with lots of money in my life. But I've never been tempted to steal it. I've never been tempted to shoplift. But I've been tempted in other areas, which I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> and Jesus himself was tempted to use his power. 
right from the beginning, right here. The devil's tempting him in these three times. Use your power. Change that into bread. And he was tempted. You go read through the Bible, there's a line of temptation to use his power. Then he gets to the end of his life, right to the end of his ministry. And what happens? He's up on the cross. And the people taunt him and say, You say you're the Son of God. Come down. Prove yourself to us. Do you think he couldn't do that? Of course he could. He used it for himself. Even in the last moments of his earthly life in the body, the guy next to him, the thief next to him, turns to him and said, Aren't you the Son of God? Why don't you save yourself and us? Come on, let's use your power. And we will be tempted where we're weak. And it's at that time that you need to know how you are going to combat that. How you're going to combat that. And the battle goes on in our minds. Someone once said, when God gives you an idea, it's inspiration. When the devil gives you an idea, it's temptation. You're choosing every day which thought you're going to dwell on and which thought you're going to let go of. That's why a devotional time each day is so important, folks. It's starting that morning with God, with the scriptures. I just find every day there's something in that scripture that's going to help me through that day. I'm telling you, it is an amazing thing. It almost seems as if the, the scripture for that day has been written for me, personally. I used to find when I used to come to church, it seemed like the minister was listening to my conversation to my wife before we went to church because that just seemed to be the subject. God speaks to us through his word. And that's why that devotional time is so important. And then thirdly, thirdly, we must talk to God. That is very, very important to talk to God. I'm becoming unstuck here. We need to know how to pray. And the Apostle Peter is such a wonderful illustration. Yeah, they're having the Last Supper. That's, that's the most sacred moment. And Jesus is talking to them about these last hours and so forth. He's talking to them about uh, the, the greatness that there is through service. And right in the midst of that, he turns to Peter. And he says, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that you that your faith should not fail. And immediately he turns and he, and he objects to what Jesus is saying. I, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. In other words, I, there's no better commitment that anybody can make. I will go with you to prison and to death. Jesus' response, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you deny three times that you know me. So much for that commitment from Peter, that he thought he'd do in his own strength. Luke goes on to tell us that he got, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And when he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, what's the first thing he turns and says to them? These words. It says, in the other translation, it says, watch and pray. Here in Luke it says, pray that you may not enter into temptation. That's the first thing, because he knows they're going to be tempted. He knows these people are coming to arrest him, and he knows they're going to react to it, lest you fall into temptation. Pray for this moment. We're going to need prayer, and he knows he's on his way to the cross. Then he goes and kneels a bit further, and he starts praying, and then afterwards he gets up after the time, and he goes, and there they are sleeping. You remember that wonderful verse, he says, could you not even spend a few moments praying for me? Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Jesus told his disciples that their prayers were essential to combat temptation. And so, when we pray for God's protection from temptation, we are agreeing with the high priestly prayer of Jesus when he said in that garden, he prayed, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one. Now that brings me to the end. The conclusion. Now three things. The helmet of salvation. The awareness. The word of God. And prayer. Those are the three ways 
that we in a phase of temptation can handle it. Those three. I close with this illustration. African uh, converts to Christianity, uh, and I'm going back about 150 years, were earnest and regular in their private devotions. And what they did is, they were out in the bush, and so when it came in the morning, they used to get up and they used to break and go into different places in the bush to go and pray. And they used to go to the same place. And so because they went to the same place, they would wear out a, a, a path to the place where they were praying. And of course, this wasn't just one day. They were praying for a long time, you know, uh, in season. And when one of them stopped praying and going out and having their devotions, they would know because... You look at their path and grass started graying on that path. And they knew this guy wasn't going for his, tempta- his prayers. And they would turn to their, to their brother or sister and say, the grass grows on your path. What's happening? And the question I ask us today, does the grass grow on our path? Is temptation beating on our door? Do we desire a closer walk with God? Prayer holds the power to change lives and to keep us united to the Father. In the Lord's Prayer we say, Save us in the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. I conclude with these words by John Bunyan. Prayer will make a man cease from sin, and sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, there are many people here this morning who are struggling with different areas, habits, temptations. And Father, we pray for each other. None of us know the extent of the pressures that some may be under this very day. Look upon us all, Lord. Read our thoughts and weigh our feelings. And by your utter resourcefulness save us in the time of trial and deliver us from all evil we pray for ourselves and the temptations we face the times when we find it easy to stray from your path we ask for sensitivity to hear your voice clearly and the discernment to choose rightly with the reassurance of your spirit's presence with us Lord, release us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we come to the prayers of intercession. Let's turn to our God in prayer. God of all, we turn to you today and ask for your help. We pray for wisdom to make right choices and right decisions in all things, to seek your truth and not be swayed by all that the world offers. We pray, Lord, for those who are easily led astray and end up in situations and places that they struggle to get out of, especially those influenced by status, money, power, drugs, and alcohol. We think of those we love and care about who are struggling with low self-esteem or feel constantly criticized at work or at home, who feel like they have been pigeonholed or cajoled into doing things they do not want to do. O oh God, we pray that you will release them in the power of your name. We thank you, Lord, for the rollout of the vaccination against the deadly coronavirus in our country and the world. And we pray that all may benefit from this initiative. And we think especially of those in the poorer countries who could well be overlooked and forgotten. We pray for world leaders as they consider their response to sharing these resources with the less fortunate. And so, Father, we come to pray for those who are known to us today, who need your healing, who need your help. Hear us now, Lord, as we mention them before you.
Lord, we commend each one into your loving arms. You know them and you know their situation. And we pray that in them your kingdom come and will be done. God of all, we ask your blessings on this church as we plan our future. Guide us in our endeavor to fulfill our purpose as your people here in Glass House and in this district. Make us aware of your will. Be with our committees and our leaders, our congregation, that truly, Lord, we may fulfill that call. We pray for the meeting that we will be meeting in in a few moments. And we ask, Father, for your leadership, your guidance, your discernment, because we want to do what is right. And we want to do what is going to be part of the extension of your kingdom in this place. That the right people will be invited. And so we commend all that we do this morning in your hands. And especially we pray for our chairman that you would bless him as he leads us. And so, Lord, we commit all these prayers in and through the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, into your hands. Amen. Now say with me the Lord's Prayer, will you? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord, out of the fullness of your gifts, we bring our offerings to you and dedicate not only that which we have given, but also our lives to the furtherance of your work here on earth. We also dedicate ourselves and pledge that we will live this week in the service of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And now receive this blessing. Maker and friend, send us out in your Spirit's power. Protect us from all that pulls us away from you. Lead us, guide us, inspire us in every moment of our lives. And to that end we say, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the grace of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.